just coming back to the book, and th this book, and, and I, mean, I mean this as a compliment, it, 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 there's many things that it's not. It's not a typical political book. It's not a self-promotion book. It's not, you know, why I should be Prime Minister of Canada. It's not even why... Well, it is, actually. But it is, I know. But, but it's, I didn't think it's you more complicated than that. Yeah, so. yeah, it's very subtle then, right? But it's... Um, it isn't a typical uh, straight from the shoulder kind of political book, um, you know. Nor is it philosoph purely philosophy, purely history. And I wonder if, if what your sort of seminal idea was. I mean, what made you write the book? Why did you want to write it? And what did you hope it would achieve? Um, gee. Um. I wanted to. Yes. I wanted to oh, write. No, no. I wanted to write <laughs> it because uh, I, I wanted to try to bring together um, my own sort of. I mean, this sounds like a really pompous word. My own intellectual history, my own development of some of my political ideas and other ideas, uh, with my my practical experiences, with what I'd actually seen in the world, and and how I thought this was may be helpful in terms of looking at where the world seemed to be going, where we seem to be heading. Um, and I guess that's the simplest way I can express it. And, and uh, you know, and I wrote it because I, I had a lot of these ideas in my head for a long time, and I just want to say, can I actually put these ideas down uh, in, in, in print? It's not a, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right, it is not a, 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 a regular politician's book. That's not and I have a lot of my colleagues who read it and say, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there, you know, and I sort of say, I know what you mean, I know it's hard, I mean, it's not that easy, you know, it is a challenge, it's not like, it's not a, not every page is like a real sort of thrill to read, you know, and, but on the other hand, I, it, I, I hope it's thoughtful, and I, because I think we have to be, I don't think being thoughtful and being in politics should be a, a contradiction, I think it should be possible <laughs> to be thoughtful and be yeah. in politics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's well, held me back, but I don't think yeah. it should be... A, I don't, I don't think it should eliminate me completely. Uh, <laughs> well, and you do make that point in the book, and I, I have to say, and I mean, part of the journalistic job is to never give an inch with politicians, but is, it, is a, it is a very fine book, and I think there is a real public service in it, and I, I don't want to shill for the publishers, but I hope people do buy it or read it or steal it. Sorry. Uh, I think that's a Lawrence Ferlinghetti piece of advice. Steal right. this book. Right. But um, anyway, if you would, it's very kind of you to um, be here tonight and to take some questions, and I guess afterwards you'll be uh, signing books at, at the back. Sure. Happy so to. So if we could take some questions now. Good evening. Uh, my question has to do with uh, a campaign to have the UN General Assembly vote to expand the mandate of the International Criminal Court to include environmental crimes. And I'm wondering what uh, wisdom or perspective you could bring on that, uh, that uh, agenda. Well, I think the, uh, um, we, we, when we look at our own, our own uh, criminal code, uh, we we would have some uh, criminal uh, liability for for negligence, for example, for criminal negligence or for or for acts that are you know deliberately uh, costing lives. Uh, so if you use that analogy, I mean, one of the things that I try to argue in the book is that when we think about the world, we should think about where we live. So we say to ourselves, we want to live in a world that's secure. We want to live in a world that's that's prosperous. We want to live in a world that that in which people can live together in a community and have a degree of of uh, solidarity with one another. That social justice is there. So I, I I do think that over time, we've seen the the evolution of international law as trying to include more and more uh, capacity to enforce. Um, laws, <clears throat> you know, I mean, we have the International Criminal Court, which is supposed to deal with, with the worst cases of, of, of crimes against humanity and of, of, of crimes that involve um, real uh, horror and hardship. Um, when we look at some of the worst cases of environmental disaster, we've tended to see those in, in the light of uh, civil suits and civil liability in the countries in question. 
But I think one of the questions that we're, we're going to be addressing as time goes on is this question of corporate social responsibility and also giving a greater capacity to international agencies to actually enforce where there have been clear infractions. I still think that in the case of environmental liability, it's more likely to be civil liability. And I think in the case of environmental issues, it's in the case of criminal, if it were to be a criminal prosecution, it would be more likely in the area of negligence than it would be in the area of, of something that would go beyond that. But certainly when you look at uh, some of the worst cases uh, uh, of, uh, I mean, the Bhopal disaster, we can think of others, uh, where there has been such a huge loss of life and such a terrible catastrophic result as a result of, of a gro gross negligence on the part of uh, corporations. Yeah, I think there does have to be some, some capacity to enforce the law. So I think we'll see that emerge as time goes on. And we'll have to see where BP fits in that equation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. again, the question would be um, how you enforce that liability. I don't think that... I don't think Congress has been reluctant to enforce the liability on BP. I just had a question. Um, we see a trend in the Middle East and with Arab countries that they're theocratic states, that the religion has lots of sway in, in revolutions, in particular Iran, where uh, the Shah was removed and it became a fundamentalist Shia state. How do we know that this won't happen in Egypt again? And if it does, will Canada and the United States step in uh, to deter that or, or change it because we didn't, uh, you know, when the Shah was overthrown and we see the, humans right, the human rights violations in abundance and how do we know this won't be a replay of what happened then? Well, we, we don't. Um, and that's one of the challenges. I mean, there are some important economic differences, I mean, as well as social differences. Um, Egyptians are very, uh, are very clear when they, when they I find in conversation with Egyptians and saying, we're Egyptians, we're not simply Arabs, we're, we, we represent a, a, a culture and a, and a way of life that we're Muslim, we're obviously, um, Egypt was, was caught up in, the, in the, great, uh, the great transformation of the 7th and 8th centuries, which, which led to the spread of Islam across, across the Arab world and across much of, uh, well, for a time, much of Europe as well. Um, so the, answer, the short answer to your question is we, we, we don't know exactly what the transformation will be, except to say that there is a profound secular movement within Egypt that I, I think is, so far has shown itself to be quite different than, than we've seen in a number of other, of other places. But the question that you then ask is, well, how do we intervene? And, and that's, a very, that's, again, a very good question. There's no easy answer. Could we, what does intervention mean? Sending it, should we send, is anybody suggesting we should send troops to Egypt to say, well, I'm sorry, you can't have this, you've got to have that? I, I think that would be, frankly, disastrous. And I think it would have been disastrous for us to have gone into Iran and said, you know, we're going to occupy you until you come to your senses and choose the kind of government we want you to choose. Again, I mean, part of what I talk about in the book is how it took Europe most of the 16th and 17th centuries to figure out that killing people because they worship differently was a stupid idea. Uh, it took about 200 years to get that out of our system. And then the entire 20th century, we ended up arguing about another set of theologies <laughs> around Nazism and communism, which were really secular religions of, of a very powerful, a powerful kind. So I'm not sure we, we're in a position to say, you know, we know what to do. Uh, I, I think we've learned uh, the hard way that killing people because they have a different language or different religious view or different ethnicity is wrong and stupid and 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 you know is just is just not the, not the way to behave. But I don't think that we know exactly what form the the political movement in in Egypt will take. Let's not forget, Egypt had, had, a, had a revolution in 1952 when Colonel Nasser took over and, and they got rid of the king, King Farouk, who went off to his yacht somewhere else and you know, disappeared. And the colonels took over and they had a very, they were, they were not uh, theological, but they were.